How's everyone doing today? Welcome back to On The Ball. Welcome back to Review The Prem, which is the follow-up show, obviously, of Predict The Prem, where me and my brother go head-to-head -head in predicting Premier League outcomes. As you can see, the scores at the moment, 57 points to Sim, 56 points to me. The way the scoring works, it's five points for a completely correct scoreline, one point for a correct result. And the star man, we do pick a man each week. And once you pick that man, you can't pick them again for the rest of the season. And it's five points for a goal and two points for an assist. Let's get straight into the weekend's football starting off at Molyneux Wolves 1 Liverpool 3 Sim went 4-1 I went 2-0 to Liverpool so both of us going and getting a point here Sim so close to that five pointer but it just wasn't to be um, but look Wolves played a really good game in the first half to be fair kind of stifled Liverpool um, had a few chances themselves but I felt like once Liverpool got on top in that second half there was only going to be one winner really yeah and I think the big failure for Wolves is they didn't take full advantage when they were on top they had the I thought Pedro Neto is absolutely outstanding in that first half he gave Joe Gomez no end of troubles and literally every time Wolves got the ball they were just passing it down the, um, their left hand side and Pedro Neto was um, running rings around um, Joe Gomez he obviously assisted uh, Huang for the first goal and he set and I think the big moment probably the big turning point was halfway through the half he sets up uh, Matthias Cunha and it was a massive chance which um, Cunha just got all um, got it all wrong all ends up it was a brilliant cross from Neto and look, as the game said at 1 0, I saw Wolves putting a lot of energy into that performance and pressing Liverpool really high and stifling them, as you say. But I questioned whether they were going to be able to keep that up for 90 minutes. And once Liverpool got a foothold in the game, um, will they be will they be ruining those missed chances? And that's exactly what happened. Gakpo um, equalised, and actually that was his last touch of the ball. Mm. He equalised on I think just before the hour mark, and they bring on Nunes and Diaz, and that's what they can do. Liverpool that firepower off the bench. Even Harvey Elliott came on and made a difference as well. And I felt like Nunes came on, gave them that different focal point in in um, and more physical presence in the box. And I think the pressure told. They were, um, I think once Liverpool uh, basically had control of the game there was no looking back albeit it did take them till the 85th minute to, to pretty much get the winner and Jose Sarr will not be happy with his part in that winner no I mean it was the weekend of late shows wasn't it it really was and another late show was in the next game which was Aston Villa 3 Crystal Palace 1 both of us going for 2-1 in that game um, I felt like Villa were by far the better team in this game but Crystal Palace did score and open the scoring just after half time a bit against the run of play but then a, a complete late showing from Aston Villa got the deserved points in my opinion three goals right at the end Duran gets one on 87 minutes 98 minutes Douglas Louise gets another goal for the seed and Lewis uh, Leon Bailey gets one in the 101st minute as well for Aston Villa um, but let's talk about Odison Edward because he's finally getting to grips with life at uh, Crystal Palace four goals already uh, this season very impressive from him yeah, he's doing very well and it was a really nice finish um, right at the start of the second half against the run of play, which uh, put Palace in the lead. And look, he's he's getting a few goals at the moment and he's always been a decent poacher, but for some reason or other, they haven't created enough chances for him ever since he's been in the Premier League. But at the start of this season, he's definitely started in red-hot form. So credit to him, whether he can keep up. He needs to, if he can hit that 10 goal mark, I think that'll be a very good season for him. But four goals in the first five games, I don't think you can ask for too much more. But yeah, I think uh, Palace will probably consider themselves lucky to be one nil up albeit once they were one nil up they did have chances to make it two and they'll probably be kicking themselves that they didn't kill off the game um, when they did but I think Villa got their reward um, for what was a dominant performance um, in the end Duran with an unbelievable finish chested it down on the edge of the box volleyed it into the roof of the net brilliant in 19 years of age he's, he's making a little bit of an impact for Villa as well this season so far but I have to say controversial the penalty that they won the game with because Richard slides in, I think, gets a couple of touches on the ball. The referee gets sent to the monitor to overturn his decision of, of the penalties. And he given, didn't, yeah. And he rejects it. Um, and I think that was quite an odd decision for the referee. He stuck with his original decision. I think it was the wrong decision. So I think Palace have a right to feel a bit aggrieved about that. And then obviously Leon Bailey seals it. So I think Palace probably a bit, a bit I think were probably deserved to lose on the balance of play, but can feel a bit aggrieved with how they lost it. Yeah, no, exactly like you say, pretty much. But I'm just getting sick and tired of speaking about these refereeing decisions week in, week out. And it's not just this season, it's last season. It's every season now we're just talking about referees and it feels like it's getting worse uh, as opposed to getting better. Uh, but let's move on to Fulham against Luton. Finished 1-0 to Fulham and Sim went for 1-0 to Fulham. I went for 3-1 to Fulham. Um, but Sim gets the big fat five-pointer for this one. I get one point and... 
I think it pretty much played out exactly as you expected, uh, didn't it, Sim? It, well, if anything, I think Newton will feel unlucky they didn't get anything out of the game, to be honest, because they were actually the ones making the better chances uh, throughout a lot of this game. With um, They hit the post before Fulham went on to score. Look, Luton, obviously, they know in the Premier League that even against teams like Fulham, who aren't the most uh, offensive, they're still going to have to sit deep and soak up pressure because they, don't, they do have the inferior quality. But they were desperately unlucky on a few occasions not to go 1-0 up. And I thought they stifled Fulham really well throughout the yeah, game. 78% uh, possession. Yeah, they, they did, but they didn't do much with it, to be honest. And for, um, I think Luton won the one creating the better chances. But look, they made the mistake. A cross comes in, um, I think, from the left-hand side. The keeper spills it. Forced Carlos Vinicius. I think it was his first touch off, off after coming from the bench. They go 1-0 up. And Luton just don't have the quality to, at the moment to basically find a way back into games when they're, when they're losing. And again, I think this was probably Luton's best performance of the season, but another drab 1-0 defeat. From Fulham's point of view, they won the game, but far from convincing, in my opinion. In terms of Luton, I mean, with the way that they're playing at the moment, they've lost every single game in the Premier League so far. Do you give them a hope in hell? Definitely not at the moment. And to be fair to them, though, to give them their credit, they, they, they do seem to be improving game on game. And this was definitely their best performance. And they were, this is probably the, only, the first performance, I would say, that they were deserving of at least a point because um, they're unlucky but they just don't they don't seem to have the quality to put their chances away or keep the opposition out at the moment and not make mistakes a few weeks ago you said that you can see them doing a derby and getting maybe a breaking derby's record do you still feel that way you know what yeah i do to be mm. honest I'm, I'm struggling to see where more than 11 points are coming from at the moment yeah I struggle to see it yeah i kind of agree to be honest but um let's go to old trafford this was a great game of football this weekend it finished 3-1 to brighton at old trafford both of us going for 2-2 and uh we mentioned in the in the preview that man united haven't lost at home but actually they had and that was their first game under ten hag against Brighton. Mm -hmm. Brighton come back to Old Trafford and teach Manchester United another lesson um, of football. And I think like Brighton were just scintillating in this game pretty much. They tore Manchester United apart pretty much. It could have been a lot more than 3-1. Uh, to be fair, Man United also had their uh, own chances, a few chances in the first half with Marcus Rashford um, and stuff like that. But I think Brighton were just clear deserved winners in this one. I think it's similar to like a lot of patterns that have happened for Man United in this season. Like very similar to maybe like the Spurs game. Started off quite well and, and they actually created a few openings and looked like, okay, maybe they're getting their act together. And then it just fell apart. They can the goal, the first goal they conceded to Welbeck, all at sea defensively. Brilliant play from oh, that was shocking. But just like the Lalana, Lalana gets a dummy and Welbeck's just completely free in the box and able to finish. And I think from that point, once they were one nil down, it was I think the heads dropped. It seemed as though Man United lost belief and um, obviously they went and got the second goal which again all at sea defensively Pascal Gross is all the time in the world he, he sells Lissandro Martinez sends him to the shops literally sold him down the river didn't he and a good finish and then the third goal good finish by Pedro but again you've got to look at the keeper I mean he gets two hands on it and uh, pushes it into the net albeit it was a nice finish from Pedro and then it's 3-0 they did get back to 3-1 but never really looked like really seriously getting back in the game and Brighton with Ansu Fati could have easily made it 4-1 um, late in the game as well. I just feel like Man United are in serious trouble right now. Ten Hag cuts a, uh, just a stressed figure on the touchline. He doesn't see it like he's making excuses all the time when he's... Uh, in the interviews about um, we're in a bad period and it's you know he's, he's blaming other players with Sancho and Anthony situation Maguire situation as well it's not a happy camp at Man United and I, I you know you wonder where they go from here because it's not like they can really change it You're off the bench they didn't have too many options albeit I'll say Hoyland actually looked decent again he was he had had really unluckily to have a goal ruled out which um, Rashford failed to keep him playing he had a few nice touches but could only last 60 minutes um, which was actually the United crowd uh, booed the decision to take him off. So, yeah. is there maybe it was a weird sign? decision? It was a weird decision from Ten Hag. It was a fitness issue. It was a fitness issue. So, but I think like what was the Man United player doing that scored a goal at three 0 down to get it back to three one? He's celebrating like he's uh, won the World Cup final or something. Yeah, I was like, ball. what? He's a youngster, eighteen years of age. <laughs> yeah, but still, you go get the ball and you go yeah. try your hardest to go get a second. I thought that didn't sit right with me. Him celebrating like that, to be honest. No matter how old you are, um, I don't really care. To to be honest, but I said last week, uh, Ten Hag is going to get sacked this season. You uh, seemed a bit shocked by that remark. Do you feel like it could be the first sacking of the season? 
hard to say. To be honest, the way they're going, I wouldn't be that surprised right now because I, I was I was surprised how easily beaten by Brian. I wasn't surprised Brian won, but I was surprised by how easily they won, especially um, after they got that second goal. It was like a procession. It was so easy with Brian. United got nowhere near them. And the problem for United is that when San, they don't have Sancho to come back in. Anthony's out for the foreseeable future. Hoyland still bedding in. So unless Rashford is scoring, like who else is scoring? Bruno seems to be a bit lost at the moment. They need Hoyland to get to groups of things they need ASAP. Hoyland very quickly. I still think they can turn it around because I, um, I do think they've got some good players. But at the moment, Ten Hag is is I don't know I don't know how like he needs to turn it around very quickly, like really quickly. Otherwise, he could um, see himself out of a job. The Premier League is ruthless, to be honest. Yeah. And you know if 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 they continue in the way that they're going. You know, he could be out of a job very soon, but I do think that they got the players to turn it around. And not only that, they've got kind of favourable fixtures now to try and turn it around. So if they don't turn it around in like the next five games, what they got? They got, first of all, buying away in the Champions League. Don't get Difficult. much easier. But um, in terms of the Premier League, they go Burnley away next. Uh, then they got Crystal Palace at home, Brentford at home, Sheffield United away, and then it's the derby against Man City. So they've got, uh, they've got to pick up maximum points or close to before that derby. Next four, they have to they have to have three of the next uh, three wins out of four. In the yeah, next four wins at the very at, least. At yeah, the next games, I think. Yeah, uh, I think you can do that. I do think they got the players, but at the moment, they're any time any time they come up against a team that they're challenging with, they're getting annihilated. Yeah, that's the facts. Um, all right, let's move on to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium where Spurs beat Sheffield United two one in the most dramatic of circumstances we both went 3-0 to Spurs and you know what it, it probably should have been closer to 3-0 to Spurs than it was I think Spurs uh, controlled the game for the most part Sheffield United scored massively against the run of play we just couldn't find the back of the net uh, for one reason or another and then up steps Richarlison and Kulisevsky in the last minute 98th and 100th minute of the game and Spurs just about snatched the win and uh credit to uh, Ange Postacoglu and the subs that he made because every single sub that he made made an impact in that game and um, it's great to see it's great to keep up the uh, the winning start to the Premier League as well and um, it was a vital three points for Spurs yeah 100% I think we deserve the victory um, and I and I think that albeit it could have been one of those days when Sheffield United were scored against a run of pain and, and you know we'd struggled to get on the score sheet before that moment you're thinking how are we going to get even one goal um, in the net in the last uh you know, 15 minutes or so. Luckily, we had 12 minutes added on for stoppages and that was a consequence of Sheffield United with all their time-wasting antics and, you know, that they it, they basically paid the price for that at the end of the day. And I think Spurs, well, yes, we wasn't the most amazing display. I do think we're the better team. I do think that the chances we created should have been good enough to be in the lead before Sheffield United scored. So I think the fact that Sheffield United took the lead and we were able to come back and react to that and get those two late goals was a reward for our our endeavour and our never-say-die attitude. And I think the performance warranted a win as well. You look at the XG, like we had 2.6 XG to 0.5 for Sheffield United. So I think at the end of the day, we did deserve it. Um, but we got to say to score two late goals like that it could have ended very differently if uh you know it could have, if if we we didn't have a bit of luck on our side to be honest but i think we deserved that luck we did deserve the luck but again the referees i thought he was absolutely atrocious i mean from the whole the ho whole game literally he was making terrible terrible decisions from penalty shouts to time wasting to randomly booking players for no reason i mean like this was one of the worst dis refereeing displays and, and i've seen some bad ones recently but this one topped the lot i mean i think since what i've ever seen in a match to see how many decisions he actually got wrong was a mind-blowing yeah he was atrocious uh, he just managed the game horribly he was just so card happy missing penalties making really odd decisions with drop balls as well which yeah. uh, were completely wrong it was just a bizarre display from the ref in the space of like three minutes he gave two drop balls uh, for the same reason but two different decisions yeah it was, it was just like what are you doing um next up let's go to london stadium as west ham lost 3-1 to manchester the city sim went for 2-1 but i get a big fat five pointer this time i went 3-1 to manchester city uh fair play to west ham they go one nil up with james ward prowse i mean he's had an absolutely sensational start to his west ham career i think he's had a goal contribution every single one of his games uh but the second half comes jeremy doku i think 10 seconds after the kickoff uh something like that gets it back level and i felt like after that there was only going to be one winner but west ham made man city work for it and that they did bernard 
Silva gets on the score sheet with 15 minutes to go. And then Erling Haaland finally gets on the score sheet with four minutes to go because he was uh, missing some, you know, easy chances, let's say. I think he had five big chances throughout yeah. the game, Haaland. He was missing some absolute sitters. I think he missed two open goals. I think yeah. he missed a chance when Carl Walker squared it to him and he, hit, and he hit it straight at the keeper. And then obviously, finally, he did get that goal right at the end. So I don't think he can, I don't think you can say that like they didn't make the chances or deserve the victory. Even at 1 0, where West Ham had it against run of play, yeah. and uh, Man City should have, used, should have been out of sight before um, West Ham even took the lead. And um, albeit they did have a chance at 2 1 West Ham when Zuma has a header from a corner, which forced a brilliant save out of Edison. And at that moment, you know, maybe you're thinking West Ham could have got back in the game. But again, uh, Man City find the answers. I thought the goals they scored were brilliant. Um, Doku, by the way, that goal, insane, scintillating. Like you move, he moved so quickly. I think he had about seven players, defenders around him. They just couldn't get near him. And not only was he able to charge into the box, he was able to um, plant a beautiful finish into the far corner as well. He's going to be a real, really important player for Man City this season. Um, I feel. And it's a perfect start for City. Five wins out of five. And they just look unstoppable at the moment. Yeah, they really do. 100% record to start the Premier League with. And the whole of the Premier League already playing catch-up after five games. Uh, next up is Newcastle against Brentford, which was the 5.30 kickoff on the Saturday. Sim went for 1-1. One, one. I went for 2-1 to Newcastle. It did finish 1-0 to Newcastle. Um, a fairly even game, I thought, to be honest. I thought Newcastle were fairly lucky to get the, all three points. I thought a draw was probably... Um, deserved for both sides but they get away with one one nil with a Callum Wilson penalty yeah and it was never a penalty never in a million years was that a penalty I think uh, but Brentford are a bit robbed with that one Flecken pulls out the challenge Gordon clearly initiates the contact on Flecken he's going absolutely nowhere as well and um, it was actually the assistant referee the linesman on the side who um, gave the penalty and uh, the fact that VAR didn't get involved and in, and overturn that I thought was a bit ridiculous I can understand Thomas Frank's frustration and that was really the difference between the two sides because Newcastle never really looked like scoring before that Brentford had a couple of um, threatening counter-attacks but as well Newcastle I think dealt with what Brentford had pretty comfortably this game should have finished nil-nil and I think Newcastle just got very lucky that penalty went, on, went in their favour what's going on with Newcastle this season last year um, at times they looked like a really solid outfit getting points consistently the last four games they picked up one point uh, three points sorry and one was and it was a lucky three points yeah lucky three points they just haven't started the season uh, well enough to be fair the three games they did lose to were three tough games they lost to uh, Man City Liverpool and Brighton but they lost but, five but all the, season last the, yeah, year yeah but at the end of the day if you're going to be a, if you want to kick on and be a Champions League team, you can't be losing all three of those games, especially when if you dig deeper, ten men for the majority of that Liverpool game, and and that Brighton game was atrocious. They weren't in that game for a second in that Brighton game. So there's definitely something wrong. I don't think you can look at those games and just say, oh, they're tough games, so you give them a pass. I don't think 100%. you give them a pass in those games, especially how they played out as well. So there's definitely something a bit wrong at Newcastle. Albeit again, Brentford is never an easy game. Brentford have shown to be tough opponents, but their lack of creativity has got to be a bit worrying and um they didn't re they seem to really struggle on the wings to really penetrate barnes was a bit anonymous anthony gordon on the right hand side didn't really get involved um and th i don't know what's wrong with them at the moment maybe they're struggling to uh maybe meet that higher bar that they met that they had last season even though they made a good few signings like tonali and uh, a, a few other i can't even remember who they signed in the summer but tonali and, B and barnes obviously sticks out but they ha I don't know if those are signings that are really going to improve them massively. Mm. And maybe that's that's the case. But they haven't even kept the same level as what they were at last season. Yeah, they're, they're struggling at the moment. Look, it's still very early days and they could go on a winning run. You know, maybe this could... You, sometimes you just need a win to, to change your fortunes and change the mood around the club. And you never know. They go San Siro midweek and if they can get a, a good positive result, maybe they can start a run. But at the moment... All doesn't seem completely right at the moment, especially the performance level. That's the most concerning thing more than the results. You kind of look at it now. Uh, Burnley at home next game, West Ham away, Palace at home, Wolves away. Again, like we were saying for Manchester United, I think it's imperative for Newcastle to start picking up some serious points now. But I don't think Eddie Howe's anywhere near as much pressure, under as much pressure as uh, Ten Hag. But if he does start dropping these games in these next three, four games, he's going to start to become under pressure. You'll start to feel it. We'll see how ruthless these Newcastle owners are. Yeah. Um, all right. Next up is Bournemouth against Chelsea. A first nil-nil of the Premier League came wow. at the Vitality um, and Pochettino under 
pressure already <laughs> as yeah. Chelsea manager. Three one, Sim went. I went two one, both to Chelsea. And why can't Chelsea do anything against anyone? I mean, they are shocking. They really are shocking. They're not doing. They literally. I was watching this game, and it was just like there was just nothing to see. Literally nothing to see here. They've they last two games have had thirty shots, no goals. Um, they they're really struggling to put the ball in the back of the net. To be fair to them, I thought they were a bit better in this game than they were in the last game. But again. They, they're so poor in front of goal. They can't fit score for love nor money. They're, they're, Nicholas Jackson just can't seem to find the target. They're playing this weird formation where Enzo seems to be in like the number 10 position. You've got Sterling on the right, Mudrik on the left, but he, he seemed completely uh, horrific. He got taken off, on, off the hour as well, and Pochettino still says he's got a lot to learn. Sterling, to be fair to him, is the only one who's playing well at the moment, but still couldn't really find the... Uh, find the killer the killer pass or the killer shot he did obviously have that free kick which hit the bar that was a lovely moment for him but unfortunately for him uh bounced the wrong side of the of the line and colwell's finish was uh ruled out for offside i felt like they were they shaded it but again they could have easily lost it if it wasn't for some really crucial saves from robert sanchez late in the game and bournemouth kind of retook control i felt late in the game if anyone was going to win it it was going to be bournemouth so i think there's still a lot of problems going on chelsea they do have a lot of injury problems but they just can't seem to make it click at the moment and they're they're, they're having the moments in the game but they're not they can't put a consistent performance but you don't them. you don't see anything on on the pitch to suggest like they're going to be serious or you know what they're trying to do what Pochettino is trying to do it just it just seems to be all over the place at the moment for Chelsea it just seems like individuals on the pitch just trying to uh, play football instead of a team unit really trying to play and that's not re really what you associate a Pochettino team with yeah. um, and he seems very frustrated um, in press conferences and interviews on the touchline he was cutting a pretty frustrated figure I and think. this is already after five games like do you see it like getting better quickly for Chelsea or is it just going to be a long hard slog for them oh, it's difficult to say I, th I mean off the back of finishing 12th last season as well and then you're bringing a whole load of young players it's going to take time and they're going to have to be patient with it Chelsea fans if they want to see success but Pochettino you know said before in pre-season that cl clubs like Chelsea it's not about a project it's about winning now and mm. it's weird for him to say that when he should be the one calling for a project if if um because surely that's what Bowley has kind of... That's the remit from Bowley, surely, is that this is a project and this is going to be a long-term thing. If he believes that it's a, it's a results... Obviously, it is a results business and you have to see progression, but if Pochettino's of the belief that he's here to win now and, you know, start competing, then he might see himself out of the door very quickly. Yeah, and it's like... And then he said that before the season started, but now he's blaming all the injuries. 15 injuries. Uh, the fans know this. The fans booed uh, the team and Pochettino off the pitch after this game. Yeah, it's turning toxic a bit because I saw a um, clip after the game. Chilwell went over to the away fans and they were booing him. Really? And I was like, wow. I mean, is it really tur turning that bad? Like, Chilwell's been a good player for them. Yeah, but when you look at Chelsea finishing 12th and starting the season with one win in five games and that win only coming against Luton. I mean, do you blame the fans for being like toxic and being really upset? It's, I don't think they're booing him because he's Chilwell or they're booing Chilwell. I think they're just going to boo any Chelsea player that comes their way. Yeah, but sh I think Chelsea fans are smart enough to know. You, you've, I know they've... Are they? Well, it should be. They should be are they? <laughs> are they? <laughs> Some of the ones I've, I've spoken, I've seen on uh, podcasts and stuff, all, they're all calling for like, this is going to be a rebuild patient stuff. But when you spend a billion or, you know, on transfer fees, like you should obviously you should expect a bit better level 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 performance than what you're seeing. And I think a lot of the Chelsea uh, fans maybe were sold a dream at the beginning of the season with the money spent and Pochettino coming in that things were going to instantly improve and maybe they've been hit with a bit of a reality check. When you look at their form from second half of the season last year all the way to the present day, you're talking about proper relegation form. Well, actually, literally you are because in 2023... You know what the funny thing is? If you take literally a, a, a league table of 2023, they are second bottom, and the bottom and bottom of the league is Everton, who have two games in hand on, on Chelsea. What, what are we saying? So, Ag Agent Poch has taken him down. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe he really was. Maybe he really did see them as a rival. Go on, the Poch. <laughs> if he takes them down, is he getting he's a, a uh, is he getting a hero's <laughs> welcome at Tottenham Stadium? 100%. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on and let's uh, talk about Everton against Arsenal. It finished 1-0 to Arsenal at Goodison Park. They did break that Goodison Park who 
Voodoo. Both of us went for one nil, and we both get five points in this one. It wasn't um, the hardest game to predict. Let's be honest. I thought Everton were absolutely shocking in this game. Um, they didn't provide any sort of threat against Arsenal. I thought Arsenal it was easy for them to play for the majority of the game. I thought the first twenty minutes was probably Arsenal's best period uh, with Martinelli uh, running rings down that left hand side. Um, but look, they probably should have got more goals. But I think uh, they probably didn't create enough for how poor Everton actually were. Yeah, well, yeah, that's what I would say. I mean, obviously, I thought that goal being ruled out was a bit ridiculous. Yeah. I thought that should have been... Cause it, and Ketia was like nowhere near the play. Like, what, did, yeah, Is that why I mean, they, they think, offside did it? I mean, letter of the law, it's technically um, a goal. Uh, I'm sorry, it's technically offside. But I think... It depends. It basically depends whether you see that Beto challenge as a deliberate act or not. I personally would see it as deliberate. I think he deliberately tries to block the pass, and I think he gets something on that. Um, but I guess technically you have to have control of the ball and pass it to be for it to be a deliberate act. And they didn't see it like that. So even though Gabriel's pass was supposed to be a square pass, it counts as a pass towards Martin mm. um, Inketia, and technically he's offside. So I think it was very unlucky. Look, Arsenal, it was a weird one. I think they completely dominated, 100%, and Everton offered absolutely nothing, but I think there's a lot to do with how Arsenal controlled the game, and there was a few occasions where Beto had like a one-on-one -on -one with Saliba, and he just couldn't um, get any joy out of him, and I think Arsenal controlled the game really impressively, but you st still a bit of a worry that they really failed to create too many chances. How many saves did Pickford have to make? Not many. Not many. Like, if you, for example, if you're comparing that to, like, how many chances we created against Sheffield United, I think we were much more creative against Sheffield United than Arsenal were against um, Everton, even though we both had our struggles against low blocks. I much prefer our performance than Arsenal's performance. But I think Arsenal, in a weird way, probably had more control of the game than we did against Sheffield United. But we were much more created, I, I felt, in the final third than, way, than they were. But a lovely goal from Trossard. Look, they found that moment of quality uh, with 20 minutes to go. Never really looked like conceding in the last 20 minutes. And they saw the game. What a finish, by the way. Yeah, what a finish. 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 Unreal. Credit. So I think it's a solid win. I wouldn't say they were impressive, but they were very solid. And it's like one of those professional away, away performances where you can't have too much. To which which about. Arsenal are used to doing at the moment. You know, yeah. they did it against Crystal Palace earlier on the season. So two away games, both 1-0 wins. Um, is there anything in these Arsenal performances to tell you that they're going to kind of replicate what they did last season? Um, I feel, well, look, at, at the moment, they're not playing as well they, as they were. But I guess the old adage you know when you're winning when you're not playing well it's, it's a sign of a good team isn't it and you, you just know Arsenal have another level to go to but as a Spurs fan talking from experience I can say that last season we probably I would say we had a very similar start in terms of performance level and getting the results we were getting good results mm. in fact last season Spurs in their first um, seven games had five wins and two draws and we yeah. were like okay we're not playing well but we're getting results and that's a sign of a good team you just wait till we click then, you just yeah, wait and, saying, <laughs> and then it never happened and we actually fell apart yeah. not to say it's going to happen to Arsenal but I think that is definitely something just to be wary about but even though they're winning the performance levels have definitely not been the same so unless their performances start to improve there has got to be a bit of something to worry about there. Yeah, with the North London derby coming around the corner, you just know that that game probably going to yeah. kickstart their season, isn't it? They always it always happens, always happens something like this where Arsenal go into it um, either with the chips are down or not playing that well, and then suddenly they just kick into gear. They turn into prime Barcelona. Yeah, the one thing I would say, like with Arsenal, like if they if the result if performances don't improve, then all of a sudden they do get a, a bad result or two. People will look back at this run and say, well, yes, we got the results but we weren't playing well and they're going to hold that against um, Arteta and Arsenal yeah. if that does start to happen so they just got to hope that the performances start to improve a bit yeah and last but not least Forrest against Burnley which was Monday night football finished 1-1 Sim went for 2-2 two -two, so he gets a point on the board I went for 2-1 to Forrest and it was actually a really good game of football two really good goals in the game um, I think his, his name Amdui Am, Amdouni Am uh, scored a great goal um, really great work from the kid on the left hand side he is class he really is class I noticed him against Spurs and I thought look this guy's a player and again, he pulled through yesterday playing some really good stuff. But I think uh, yesterday belonged to Callum hudson Adoy. Was it his debut for Nottingham Forest yeah. yesterday? Um, he had a he tested the keeper a couple of times, but that goal that he scored. First of all, what a lovely takedown from Awayo. Awe, Awe, Awe. I can't pronounce any of these plays. <laughs> Awayoni. Uh, don't pronounce it right, not getting the point. Awoni, <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> uh, great, great touch from him and great takedown from him. But the way Callum hudson Adoy took that on, curled yeah. it right into the top corner that is world-class stuff from Callum 
he's always had that in him, Hulazan Adoy, but he's just never been able to show it consistently. And maybe at Forest, it could be, maybe that maybe that's time for him to you know find his home. But for some re- one reason or another, he's got that quality, Hudson Adoy, but he's now, what, 23, 24, and he's, his career stagnated horrifically for the past four years. And I, I would love to see him back in, in full flight and actually at the top of his game. So hopefully it's a sign of maybe that's something uh, to see. First point of the season for Burnley, though they'll be happy with that. Get that, um, just get that monkey off their back. Just get that. It's a good point, point as well. It's a good point. Forest away is not an easy place to go. I think they're well worth the point as well. They played some good football, and Foster getting. Um, he looked like he got the winner, but the little handball kind of, uh, which was you know controversial decision, but probably the right decision in my opinion um, to rule it out, and um, that was unfortunate for but for Burnley. And then Foster gets himself sent off. So. That was a ridiculous kind of heat in the moment elbow from him, which was a stupid decision. So uh, it might cost them in the next few games. He'll be missing three games. And he, um, he's their top goal scorer and he was looking bright as well. Mm. So big shame for them. But a good point, good point for Burnley. And Forrest to stay in the top 10. So I think they'll be all happy with the point as well. You know what? I'm looking at Forrest and everyone was clowning on them last season for signing like 20 players, 25 players, whatever it is. Everyone's saying, yeah, they're going straight back down. They're going to do a Fulham. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. Steve Cooper did a brilliant job, especially with his home performances last year. And you're looking at their team now. World Cup winner in Montiel at right back. Ibrahim Sangare and Mangala in the middle of the park. And Elanga, Morgan Gibbs-White, Callum hudson and Doy, and Awani in attack. I mean, they're looking like a solid outfit. And they've even let go of, you know, Brendan Johnson, who was their best player last season, and still look like they're, they're a good team. They've got good players in there, and they've replaced him fairly well. So I think they're looking solid at the moment. And maybe um, if they continue, uh, if they can really start to gel properly, then maybe they could get a fight for the top 10 at the moment. But yeah. I still think their first um, priority is uh, avoid the drop. Yeah, absolutely. But I think, I actually genuinely think that they could be the next club to go and challenge the Brentfords and, and those kind of teams around that area of the the, the um, p- uh, table. Mm. Let's move on to star. Man, Sim went for Diogo Jota. Zero goals, zero assists. And I went for Taiwo Awoni and he got an assist um, and no goals. So I get two points there. And we end this week on 72 points to Sim, 73 points for me. I think we've changed leads every week. So every far, week, yeah. So, yeah. So <laughs> well, we'll go. see what happens next week. But thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We'll see you all very soon. And yeah. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>